Becoming your own studio in a less lame way than YouTube influencers is the future for everybody. There's a way to become Yorgos Lanthimos from your garage. And I think that's the future. Just a quick note before the episode, we're excited to announce that Souvenirs, the first Studio Fest film written by Matthew Servillo and directed by Anna Mikami, is now available to rent on Amazon Prime Video and Redbox. Links to the rental pages are in the description below. This episode of Demystified is brought to you by Marmoset. Marmoset, together sounds better. Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make your debut feature, submit your short film or feature-length screenplay now at filmfreeway.com slash studiofest. This series exists in both video and podcast form and is designed to be experienced either way. You can find the video version at moviemaker.com or the audio version wherever you get your podcasts. From Studio Fest and Movie Maker Magazine, this is Demystified, a series about an innovative new way to make movies and what it really takes to make an indie feature film. My name's Jake Bowen, and this series is about shedding light on the parts of getting an indie film made that are never seen and rarely talked about through the lens of Studio Fest, a one-of-a-kind annual film festival that awards one writer and one director the chance to make their debut feature film. Last time, we talked about how Mark Duplass famously said, The cavalry isn't coming. He beseeches filmmakers not to wait for some gatekeeper to pluck them out of obscurity and fund their dream project, because that virtually never happens. He also stressed the importance of forming friendships and collectives with other artists to help make one another's projects in a world where no one else will. And we talked about how Studio Fest is trying to pioneer a new model to fit into that landscape. Now you might be thinking, that speech was great and all, but it was five years ago and it's just one guy's point of view. And fair enough. So I started pulling excerpts from existing interviews with filmmakers who found success in the last 10 years in order to make the case that the need to self-start has only become more imperative in the years since Mark Duplass's career began. And the folks at Movie Maker said, instead of pulling clips from old interviews, why don't you guys just interview them yourselves? And I was like, we can do that? And they were like, yeah. Now, it just so happens that one of the filmmakers we wanted to speak to, the director and star of Thunder Road, Jim Cummings, just released his second feature film, The Wolf of Snow Hollow, which is available now on Video On Demand. We have every reason to believe that this monster will show up again tonight. To listen to the first part of this interview, in which movie makers Tim Malloy talks to Jim about his new movie, acting, serial killers, and more, go check out and subscribe to Movie Maker Interviews over on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. The cavalry is not... Cummings. Jim Cummings is an outspoken advocate for DIY filmmaking. We talked to him about his philosophy, his critics, treating film financing like a startup, the diminishing role of Hollywood, and the future of indie filmmaking. Can we get just like a rundown of your your progression, starting with the short film of Thunder Road? I started making movies out of college. I made a, a 73 minute movie that was just relatively boring. I got all my friends to come down to New Orleans and shoot it. I spent a year and a half editing it and it played at one film festival. And after that, I was like, I'm just a terrible filmmaker. I'll never, I'll never make it. But I was writing screenplays the whole time and I was producing for friends of mine. Some of my friends had made some like small viral successes on Vimeo. And so I was like producing and running Kickstarter campaigns and doing doing all that kind of stuff to help my buddies. I did a Patrick Wang feature that got into Cannes. I was an associate producer with Trey Schultz doing post on Precia. Got a job at College Humor and then got so pissed off at the quality of stuff that I was seeing in my workplace that I was like, I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna do something impressive. And then that became a short film that I wrote on my drives to and from work uh, called The Thunder Road. My mother didn't believe in any of this. Not that that's a bad, you know, she didn't judge anybody or anything. She just, anyway, she loved everybody and cared for everybody and never put herself first. Her whole life, I'm starting to think. She, sorry, thank you everybody for coming. Captain, Kev, Tony, you got people here. Judy, thank you. Means a lot. Um, it blew up. It was on the front page of Vimeo, and Vimeo was such huge champions of the movie. Like 750,000 people have watched this ridiculous short film of me humiliating myself in a funeral home. Just deceptively simple. One-shot monologue about yes. a man melting down oh oh is a mini masterpiece of writing, directing, and acting. Sundance short film Grand Jury Prize goes to Thunder Road, directed by Jim Cummings. 
and I spent a year trying to do my paparazzi horror movie and that financing fell through because people couldn't see the transition between horror and the drama that is Thunder Road. And so instead we did nine more single take short films. It was all I could get paid to do. Full screen paid us to make six short films that are now our feature called Minutes. And then we got paid to make three more short films by topic. And so by that time I felt like it was okay to expand into features. And then I wrote the Thunder Road feature and then spent a month and a half or two months developing it with Zach Parker, who is the other investor that put up 50 grand. And I put up 50 grand from shooting humiliating Kahlua commercials. I play a character called Coach Kahlua. Hey guys, it's Coach Kahlua. And basically took all of that money and put it directly into making the Thunder Road feature. And then running a Kickstarter campaign to finance that movie. And then we shot that with kind of the same crew that I was making short films with, a production company called Vanishing Angle. To the haters out there, I guess, the people who would hear your story and go, well, you say anyone can make a movie, but I don't have this. I don't have a, a Sundance winning short or my friend can't, you know, help me do it or whatever. Your path isn't applicable to me. What What is like your response to that when you hear that kind of thing? The money problem is always a problem. I mean, obviously in any industry, you need the, the capital to start a, a, a startup company. And I do see that fewer people are starting startups than I was expecting. Like I thought that our mm-hmm. campaign was going to get people to be like, okay, cool. This is a, a way to do it the, uh, ourselves. I hope that that mind virus of uh, of uh, people are successful because they've cheated the system thing um, doesn't fool everybody. One of the top detractors that I have on Twitter, I said, go make your movie. And it was my pinned tweet for a while. And a a filmmaker, her tweet was on top of it saying, yeah, but where's the money coming from? It was her pinned tweet for a full year saying, fuck you to Jim Cummings, basically. And I DM'd her, hey, I'm happy to help you run a WeFunder campaign or a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, Let's do it. And then she said, yeah, that's great. Let's do it. I'm working on this thing. And it's been six months or something like that. And I think she said that she didn't want to run one. I think a lot of this stuff is people who have to have a reason for why they're not successful. That is part of it, obviously. But then in the future, you know, five or six years from now, all of this is going to be normal. Kickstarter campaigns are normal now, but WeFunder campaigns are going to be normal. And all of those pockets of I can't do it myself are just getting smaller and smaller and smaller, so much so that our grandkids are going to look back on us and be like, wow, grandpa could have been a filmmaker and didn't. And how f***ing sad is that? Also, I'm a special case because our movies cost 200 grand to make. The Thunder Road feature costs 200 grand. It's a huge amount of money. Trey Schultz made Cretia in his backyard for 35 grand with his friends and family. Joe Swanberg has made movies, like 20 movies for like 20 grand or something like that. The technology is there where you can walk into a fucking Best Buy and get a 4K camera that competes with the cameras that they're shooting Avatar with. All of these excuses are just getting smaller and they're made by people. They haven't done the research or they, they don't know this stuff. It's an educational gap. Thunder Road, like you said, you raised two hundred thousand dollars. It hit like a bomb. But I was just curious if you hadn't raised that much money. Let's say you raised fifty, you raised twenty five. Would you have made the movie anyway, or maybe pivoted, or just sought other sources? Or with Thunder Road, I knew that we would be able to raise that money. Um, and we had a ballpark. So I was a producer for six years. And so I knew kind of what the, the script was going to cost um, in writing it. And also working with Natalie Metzger, who's my producer, she's always the one to say, the joke is how many producers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Does it have to be a light bulb? Trying to keep the cost as low as possible. So much so that when we were shooting the police station stuff for Thunder Road, there's a scene where I'm at a circulation desk and I'm talking to my cell phone with my ex-wife. And uh, Natalie says, does it have to be a police station? And I thought about it and I was like, no, it just has to be a wall with a blue line on it behind me and then a couple of like police knickknacks. And so she was like, cool, let's take out this shitty abandoned warehouse that has a circulation desk and we'll shoot it there. So I think that we probably inevitably would have shot it no matter what, but it was also, we weren't asking for much. So we were able to go to these people who wanted to give us money to gap finance the movie and say, we're going to give you 125% back on the money. And we were able to do that in the first year, which never happens with startups. But still, I never felt like I was accomplished. We had won South by Southwest and Sundance and it was It was these incredible accolades and people knew of us because of the short film and the feature, but then couldn't get taken seriously for the life of me. 
and then still was fighting these inadequacy traps of listening to Hollywood and being told it's okay to wait. They don't understand the landscape of the internet and how you can just do it yourself nowadays. Mark Duplass has talked about this. Some other filmmakers talk about this. Endless meetings with Hollywood that sound really promising and go nowhere. So after winning Sundance, I had 75 general meetings around town and they were all great. And we all had great conversations and they got it. And it was wonderful and we shook hands and kissed babies. And, and I was qualified as a writer, director, and actor, editor, one shot, didn't really count. But like I was qualified for four jobs basically. And I never got hired by any of those people. And, they, and it, was just a, it was just like a field trip, an in-office field trip to meet the guy who did this short film, the Sundance winner kind of thing. Um, and it was great. It was a huge compliment. I got to meet all of these cool people, top brass, people who made movies that I love. And that was great. But it never really led to a dollar. And so when I was knocking on their doors to get any money to make movies, um, it never happened. But I've made money by having people knock on our doors. That's the only way that I've been able to make money. And the only way to get people to knock on your doors is by making stuff that you put up on Vimeo or put up on YouTube and already start to prove that you can do the thing. And then it becomes their idea to be like, they'd be really good to, to do this thing. And that was kind of my experience. And so it took me a long time to get over those hurdles that I realized we were kind of our own functional studio. That's just how you have to treat it. And it's stupid because Robert Rodriguez has been telling us to do this for a while. That's 20 years. This episode of Demystified is brought to you by Marmoset. Marmoset is not a stock music site. It's a curated collection of real music by real musicians, bands, and record labels, often with entire albums available from a single musician or band. They have an award-winning music production team who collaborates with artists and bands to record original music, sound design, and custom scores. I used Marmoset while editing souvenirs, and one of the coolest features I found is the ability to sort tracks by their arc, a visual representation of the progression of the music. It's extremely useful and saves you a ton of time. Visit marmosetmusic.com to browse music now. Marmoset. Together sounds better. After his success in turning the Thunder Road short into a feature, Jim started the Short to Feature Lab to help other filmmakers do the same thing. We had a lot of trouble coming up turning our short film into a feature, and we didn't want to have that happen to anybody else. So we created this lab for 10 young filmmakers who were trying to turn their shorts into features to come out and learn from us as to how we did it, and to learn from each other as to how we should all be doing it. There's a Medium post outlining the curriculum of the Short to Feature Lab if you're interested. We're really interested in your perspective on this because what we've been doing so far is sort of covering Mark Duplass's The Calvary Isn't Coming ethos. And you know, you are kind of an evangelist of this. I mean, it's the future. That South by keynote, I've seen it a couple of times, but like, I didn't realize how much it meant to the community of filmmakers of like, it's actually gonna get people off the couch. And it's also this wonderful, depression pornography. Oh, there really aren't coming and there is no help and Hollywood is falling apart. And also now, especially in 2020, it's never been laid more bare. I think the industry has jumped 10 years into the future where it really is going to be like YouTube being on iTunes, where the cream rises to the top and uh, you're in competition with the largest studios to win audiences' attention. And so I think we are living in this incredible transitional period where doing super fucked up stuff and playing rock and roll will actually get you to the top of the charts in a way that has never been possible in any other art industry. Your analogy to rock and roll is interesting because in some ways, film in general, the medium of film, sometimes it feels maybe it's going the way of rock and roll a little bit. It used to be this ascendant thing and it's kind of been supplanted in the last 10, 20 years by other genres or whatever. Do you want to talk about what you see the future looking like? Maybe a little bit more from the perspective of getting the films made and getting off the ground and getting people to see it. Yes, of course. Um, let me first pick on one small thing that you said there, because I do think sure. that the future of feature films is going to be relatively barren inside of America. International films are doing fine. They're always doing crazier stuff and making interesting stories. America is going through this thing right now where the focus shifted from when I graduated graduated from college from making 90 minute stories towards becoming famous on the internet. So I think that fetish of becoming a 90 minute storyteller is almost lost on the next generation for kids who graduated 
with 5D Mark IIs in their hands when we didn't. So that's like a really interesting cliff that you see um, when it comes to American 90-minute storytelling. The next bit you were talking about of, of how it's possible for people to be able to create a film studio in their in garage is crowd equity. We made Thunder Road by running a Kickstarter campaign. We had uh, people donate, basically. There were rewards, there were titles. You know, people would come on as an executive producer and give 10 grand. If it came on set, it became like a grad school for them, cheapest grad school ever to come on set and be able to work the full production and post-production with us. It was great. I did the same thing with Cresha. I came on as an associate producer and learned everything about sound design and how to tell a story with Trey, and it got me off the couch to make Thunder Road. So crowd equity is exactly what was going on with Kickstarter, except you're able to buy percentages of the film. So like we ran the Kickstarter campaign and we raised 36 grand and people came up to us after the campaign was run before we shot the film and said, hey, I wasn't able to back it on time. I just found it, but I'm wondering if I can buy a percentage of the company. And so we would sell off shares for a certain amount of money and that's how we gap financed the movie. And then we realized there's a future in that and it's just exactly what Silicon Valley is doing. It's exactly what any startup company would do by creating an angel list page, reaching out to venture capitalists on the internet. I say reaching out to like your friends and family and see if anybody has any money. It's not like Kickstarter. It's just opening it up to a pool of people who are already multimillionaires and they're more likely to find that page. So we did very well with Thunder Road. Uh, we did Wolf of Snow Hollow with Orion Pictures. They financed it. And then basically in post-production, we ran a WeFunder campaign, which is a crowd equity platform. And it's what startups use. We were the third or second film on the platform. And the other ones sucked. The other <laughs> ones just looked fucking awful. And they were able to raise 300 grand or something like that. No offense to those guys, but offense to those guys. And so... We built this campaign, we did all the research, we built it out like it was a Kickstarter campaign and we raised $425,000 in 17 days, 12 days, something like that. Um, obviously we'd already had the success of winning Sundance and South by Southwest and we'd already made a feature film, but we had people who otherwise were looking to invest in the arts and to be a part of something like this and we had a cool page and we immediately raised the funds to make our next film and you can fucking bet that I'm gonna be doing that exact same thing. I never have to take notes. I'm able to ensure that the movie isn't mediocre. I'm able to do the three weeks of sound design because I'm literally doing it on this computer that I'm talking to you guys with. I don't need to rent out studio space or anything. Becoming your own studio in a less lame way than YouTube influencers is the future for everybody. And you have to start ensuring that for yourselves. You have to start realizing that there's a classy way to do this that isn't, hey guys, what's up? It's Jimmy C. I'm talking to you like all that fucking stupid shit. Shit, and there's a way to become Yorgos Lanthimos from your garage. And I think that's the future for a bit. Thanks to our sponsor, Marmoset. Marmoset is a full-service music agency representing a highly curated roster of diverse and rare artists, bands, record labels, and vintage recordings for music licensing. Visit marmosetmusic.com to browse music now. Marmoset, together sounds better. Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make your debut feature, submit your short film or feature-length screenplay now at filmfreeway.com slash studiofest. Demystified is a Studio Fest production presented by Movie Maker. This episode was narrated and edited by me, Jake Bowen. It was conceived and recorded by Jess Jacklin, Charles Beal, and Jake Bowen. The theme song was composed by Patrick Patrikios. Additional tracks and music supervision were provided by Marmoset. Other tracks used under Creative Commons licenses. You can find links in the show notes to some of the tracks used in this episode. To hear future episodes of Demystified, go to moviemaker.com or visit studiofest.com, where you can also learn more about Studio Fest and subscribe to the show.